Hi, my name is Emma Wells and I'm a nutritional therapist with over 15 years experience specialising in digestive disorders and digestive testing. I'm currently studying functional medicine having completed my digestive module last year and I am the founder of Smart Nutrition, Smart SIBO Test and IBS and SIBO Clinics. I was lucky enough to meet Alison Seebecker at a SIBO Education Day last year when she kindly agreed to mentor me with some of my more tricky clients and she has since agreed to share some of her valuable time with us to do this podcast. For those of you that are new to the world of Alison Seebecker, she's a naturopathic doctor and co-founder of the SIBO Centre for Digestive Health in Portland, Oregon. Alison has specialised in SIBO since 2010 and is a widely recognised international expert and I've recently heard her being called the SIBO Queen which I think is truly fitting. Alison has a fantastic informative website called SIBOinfo.com and I recommend you take a look if you haven't already done so. This podcast today is going to focus on the different types of SIBO, the hydrogen, methane and the hydrogen sulphide. We will talk about SIBO testing and the most commonly made mistakes when testing, and we will discuss the use of probiotics and SIBO, weight gain or weight loss with SIBO, plus how long it can take to get rid of SIBO and what you can do for, to prevent it from coming back. So I'm very happy to welcome Alison Seebecker here today. Good to see Hi. you. Hi, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. We really appreciate it. I know what an incredibly busy lady you are. You're basically, you have a clinic, you're lecturing all over the world, you write widely, you have a fantastic website, you're starting to bring um, some SIBO training for your own online courses, and you're also writing a book. So how's that all going? (laughs) Ah! (laughs) It's going like anyone's life, you know? Ah! I, I... I think it would all be better if we uh, slowed the pace and maybe focused on one thing at a time, and I'm not able to take my own advice on that. Yeah, yeah, I have a little bit of that problem as well. (laughs) It's busy, (laughs) isn't it? But, I mean, you're incredibly busy. So any idea of when you think your book might be ready? Just to give people a Well, I was hoping by the end of this year, but I think it'll probably be early 2018. Okay. It just, gosh, it just takes so much longer than you think. And then, like you said, I'm working on making, um, I, I teach a, a full day course on SIBO and I'm working on getting that ready for online so anyone can access that at any time. Cause I just think the more we can get people educated, both practitioners and patients, just yeah. the better on this whole yeah. subject. Absolutely. Because there's a lot of confusion out there and there's a lot of, unknown people are only just coming across it even though you've been working with it since about 2010 i think Um, yeah but you know and also the research is evolving at such a fast pace now that you've got to keep on top of it to be able to know what to do really so so okay well one of the things before we kind of delve into the different things about SIBO one of the things i was wondering what actually brought you to SIBO what got you kind of fired up about it in the first place Well, I think it's it's because I have it, (laughs) and um, I've had digestive problems my whole life. Well, really, since I guess I was about five, and I think that's when I got SIBO. And I had, uh, as before I ever got any medical training, just as a patient, you know, had tried to get help, and it was very frustrating. And eventually got the diagnosis of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which most people, a lot of people with SIBO will, can say that they have that because it's just a conglomeration of symptoms. Um, and so uh, before we knew about SIBO, uh, because now we know SIBO is um, a cause of a majority of cases of IBS, but before we knew about that, there's nothing to do really for IBS, not really, except yeah. help manage yeah. symptoms. It's very frustrating. And um, so anyway, then what happened was I um, I found out about the term SIBO from uh, one one of my professors who then became my teammate. We we started working together on this subject, Dr. Sandberg Lewis. So he'd been my gastroenterology professor at medical school, and uh, he was just writing a book, and he came across the term and just did a little bit of research and put it in his book. So I found the term because I was helping edit his book, and then I. Uh, I just went crazy. I just started reading all about it, and and I correlated it with what I had read um, in the book Breaking the Vicious Cycle by Elaine Gottschall, yeah. uh, because she was really describing that sort of scenario. Um, and she uses the words, you know, an overgrowth of bacteria in, in the small intestine. She was thinking that 
in her book, she was thinking that that might explain why the specific carbohydrate diet worked for the people that the original creator, Dr. Haas, had used it on and then the people that she was seeing. And I actually think she might have gotten that a bit wrong. I don't think that's the the only and main reason that it worked for, for those people. But anyway, nonetheless, I saw that it was sort of the same condition she was talking about. And I just started doing all this research. And also, I had used the specific carbohydrate diet on myself. And it was the first treatment that really, really worked uh, was that diet. And I mean, within 24 hours, I, I my pain was, yeah, yeah, my yeah. pain was gone. So so anyway, uh, I'm going on and on, but the point is, because I knew that that diet had helped me, and I knew that she was talking about SIBO, although she didn't use the words like that. So then when I finally had the terminology, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, I could now do PubMed and article searches, and then the world opened to me, you know. Amazing, and yeah. I got, I got so on fire, and I, I haven't really lost that fire because – the fire comes from all of my years of suffering and, you know, all of my sleepless, painful nights and, you know, and all of my struggles going to doctors without any help and the doctors also not knowing, you know, and then I became a doctor and I went through medical training and didn't receive what I needed because no one knew. So then I, I just became passionate to help anyone, even if they don't have access to a doctor who knows even if they don't have money and, you know, how can they help themselves? They could do diet. They could buy some herbs, you know, and then for doctors, um, I'm on this mission to, you know, like to get doctors trained in this condition, especially it matters because IBS is the most um, common gastrointestinal disorder in the world. It affects up to 20, 25 percent of every country. And when you now learn that at least 60 percent or on average 60 percent of it is SIBO, then it puts some, you know, weight behind my 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 fire, my passion. Fire. It's not just yeah. my own individual um, crusade. It It's worthy. It's, it's a worthy so endeavor. Out there. Yeah, it's so out yeah. there. I think in the UK, an old statistic, this is quite a few years old now, we used to say one in 10 complaints. Um, visits to the GP is for a digestive complaint mm -hmm. but I wonder if it's possibly grown as well because it's, it's just you have to be careful because I see a lot of patients just with digestive health and you think everybody in the world has it but we know it's a huge amount of people and I know that GP's officers are inundated mm -hmm. and their hands are tied with what they can do because in the UK the NHS says this is what you're allowed to do and you can't do that and they're I'm finding some GPs and some consultants are starting to open their eyes, whereas others are like, no, never heard of it. You get somebody taking a test result and the GP can't, the thing is the GP can't act on it because of our NHS rules. Yeah. So it's it's mega frustrating for people, mega frustrating. No, and, and what I think what we have to do is if you get enough, if you do the sort of the grassroots, you get enough patients and doctors educated they will force a change in the system collectively yes. Yes. you know and we, we have that same problem here i think it's not as as difficult as in the uk but in the us we we struggle with all of this too and the fda not um covering you know insurance not covering uh, things and people just not knowing so so anyway that's why my all my efforts focus on okay. pretty much on education um, and why we're doing this, you know, get which the word is out. Fantastic, which is so helpful for people to actually to recognize that you understand the journey you've been through it, but also the amount of knowledge you've got and the research. Because I know you're continually researching. We just talked <laughs> about a paper, um, which is amazing. And then you share it willingly and openly on your SIBO Info website, which is just fantastic. Oh, such a special thing to do. And I should mention that people, if they visit it, they you also have a button for people to donate. And it would be lovely if people did, because the hours you must have put into that is That's incredible. so sweet for you to say. <laughs> yeah, but, it, you know, there is so much work on that site. It's, I mean, I have a few it, websites. Uh, Go on. What I mainly use that uh, donations for is to send my newsletter. So I send a newsletter four times a year, yeah. and it costs me money to send it out. So I, I pretty much just use the donations to pay to send out the newsletter. And in the newsletter, I just let people know of um, any courses that are coming up, and then all the research that's just come out. Um, within the last three months and then I usually write um, you know an update or if there's anything important that has just been discovered I'll let people know if there's a new way to interpret breath tests that sort of thing so yeah. so yeah. then of course that means you you know go ahead and join that newsletter it's not a marketing blog it's just to keep you updated it's on the nice. condition yeah. Yeah. yeah the newsletter is brilliant, brilliant. I, I will have to say oh 
we have a little sound thing? Has it sorted itself? We're good. Oh, we're good. good. We're good. Okay. But uh, the newsletter, I, I obviously I receive it and it's like, oh, there's a lot to read. We need to look at this. We need to read that. So it's really, it's packed. It's not just a few words. There's a lot of information in there for people, which is just fab. I love it personally. I love it. Well, so I, thanks for talking about it all. It makes well, me feel great. And I'm glad it's helping people. And the website is just always there full of information for people. Which is just fantastic. And we, or I mean, practitioners appreciate it. And I actually ask some of my clients, can you go and look at that? Or sometimes I link them. Can you just look at that page where um, Alison's talked about it? And it's so it's just a, a wealth of information, hugely helpful. So thank you for all that time. All that time. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So I think what I've done is I've assumed that most people joining and listening to the podcast probably understand a little bit about SIBO and what it actually is. Um, but just to very shortly summarise, SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that's too much bacteria in the small intestines. Doesn't necessarily have to be bad bacteria, it can be good bacteria, but it's just in the wrong place. Should be in the colon. So the overgrowth causes a lot of the symptoms of SIBO, which you can read about on Alison's website or possibly my SIBO, Smart SIBO test website. Um, and basically, and now I've forgotten what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. So uh, so what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit today, rather than just about what SIBO is, talk a little bit about the different types of SIBO, because we've got a relatively new kid on the block, and we've also, which is called the hydrogen sulfide, as well as the other two that I'm going to pass over to you in a second. And then I also wanted to talk a little bit about SIFO, because this keeps coming up in social media, and I think it would be great to just touch on kind of what, what's happening in, in the world of kind of looking at SIBO so absolutely okay well basically the I guess the main way we type it there's two ways we can type SIBO one would be by the uh, the bowel symptoms so constipation diarrhea or a mixture of the two constipation and diarrhea that'd be one way we could type it and that's how that's the way we type IBS um, as well. And then the other way would be a little bit more spe specific just to SIBO, and that's by the gas type. And so we've got hydrogen gas, methane gas uh, that can cause symptoms, and as you mentioned, hydrogen sulfide. And then um, there's sort of CFO, that's a little different. So the hydrogen gas is more associated with diarrhea, um, and we don't really know exactly the mechanism. And then the methane gas is uh, has been it's associated with constipation and directly been shown to be a cause of constipation. Methane gas itself uh, interacts with the nerves that are in the small intestine and slows the transit time and slows motility. So it directly causes constipation. Um, and um, then you could have a mixture of both of those gases. And usually when there's a mixture, there might be a mixture of constipation and diarrhea, or it might just be that one symptom predominates. And where this really matters, besides the fact of the symptoms, is in the treatment. Uh, it's one of the reasons why testing with the breath test is so important, because that's how we can see which gases are there. And then that guides our treatment, because the treatment's different when you have the methane gas, because the uh, microbes that produce it are a little harder to, to get rid of. They're a little harder to kill, and we need different agents aimed at them. And then the third type would be um, the hydrogen sulfide, as you mentioned. And this it doesn't happen as often. The hydrogen and the methane are very common. That's like you see those all the time. The hydrogen sulfide, uh, well, I guess we'll find out how common it really is because the problem is we can't test for it currently with breath tests because that technology hasn't been fully developed, fully invented and developed yet. So it's just not available yet. Um, and but we make a good guess at it because we know we know about hydrogen sulfide gas. And there are um, there are machines that can test for it that are used for research that are very large, that take up like the size of a room. So it's not like we, there's no way to know anything about it, but it's not reasonable for normal uh, laboratory testing. It's for research. So we do have some papers and things on it. And um, that gas uh, has sort of its own own set of symptoms. It could be associated with diarrhea or constipation. So it's not so clear, um, you know, yet. Uh, there hasn't been much research on it. We only have a few papers. We really only have like two that I can think of on, on SIBO. One that was just an abstract, um, meaning 
a summary without the full paper that was presented at the, the big gastroenterology conference just a few weeks ago by Dr. Pimentel. And he's been working on um, developing testing for hydrogen sulfide. And so he's done some of that and he presented his results. And the results mostly are just conf sort of confirming what we all knew, but it's good we're getting studies out there now. And same as the, as the study that was put out a year ago, which is just saying, look, this gas exists. It's, it's a, 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 um, a form of SIBO that can happen when it, you know, when this is overgrown and excessive, it causes symptoms. And if you, if we can't test for it, we're missing, we're missing some SIBO. So uh, just very briefly, the way that we would know currently on a regular breath test is uh, what's called a, a flat line. So you would see both the hydrogen and the methane being uh, very low and static like this across the whole three hours of the test. And this is where a three hour test is very important uh, some people will perform a two-hour test, and you can't uh, you can't see the hydrogen sulfide that way. You need to see the third hour because the third hour represents what's happening in the large intestine. And normally we have good bacteria, and just we just have a lot of bacteria there, and those bacteria should produce hydrogen. So when you don't see hydrogen gas occurring in that third hour. That's your real keynote. So you haven't seen it in the first two hours, but that could be a negative test. Now you don't see it in the third hour. And so then that's, okay, we think the person has hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. And how yeah. common are you <laughs> finding it in your clinic? I mean, I might be a little skewed because I do see sort of the more challenging cases. So I, I think I see more hydrogen sulfide. But even still, it's a small percent, um, maybe a fifth of my patient base. Okay. Um yeah, I'd say so. It's so it's it's a smaller percentage, which is that's so that's good to know. But um, I think what stands out and that's important is if you're really having a tricky time or your test, what really is important is if your test comes back all flat and you don't you or your doctor don't know about this hydrogen sulfide, that would just be called a negative test. Yeah. And yeah. when, in fact, you you have a form of SIBO. So that it's just important to know about that, yeah. uh, this yeah. type. I think when we send out to our test reports um, and we, we get that flat line, we've got a little bit of feedback there, um, and we send out um, the reports, we have a flat line, I will always flag up to people and let them know this looks like a hydrogen sulfide, but I usually need to ask a few questions because if somebody had had, let's say, antibiotics um, within a short space before doing the test, then it's that's going to look the same as a hydrogen sulfide test. So we need to clarify a few things before we can actually jump on the hydrogen sulfide. But once we've clarified that, we go, okay, that's really quite probable. And then um, I've been using the urine um, hydrogen sulfide test, which I think you're also using. Uh, it's not validated yet, which is a shame. It's a real shame. But I have found when I've tested it, it's come back positive, and then we've treated for the hydrogen sulfide, and I've retested with the urine. It's coming back negative. And I'm seeing this classic, some of the classic hydrogen sulfide symptoms, such as some people are getting the tingling in the extremities, is a, a pe peculiar one. Um, they're mm -hmm. clearing up. So, That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, so that test is, um, I think, available from uh, Red Labs R.E.D. Yeah. And developed up by Dr. Dermelier. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I also have it on my Smart Nutrition website. It's not on my Smart Perfect. SIBO test website, but if you test through us, then and we think it's probable, we'll then suggest that you do it. So, um, Perfect. And, and you don't have to see me as a practitioner or one of my team as a practitioner if you test through us. Um, but if you want to, we're very happy to help. But if you just want to use a testing service, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I started using that test. I found out about it from a patient who we suspected had hydrogen sulfide, and he found about this test. This was like six years ago, and at the time, the test cost thirty, you know, American dollars. It was really cheap. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like without even thinking, it's like let's just run it. So yeah. I, it, it didn't matter to me whether it was validated or not because it cost so little. He's like, well, let's just try, you know. And so I've been using it ever since. And then the price has been <laughs> creeping up. Yeah. And so now I sometimes I sometimes I may not run it because uh, because the cost is up there now, depending on the patient. Yeah. Yeah. But um, like you, I will see it correlates a good portion of the time. And then sometimes it doesn't correlate. But we see that with all kinds of things that we do anyway. Yeah. So I feel like because we haven't been able to test for hydrogen sulfide in breath, uh, you know, most physicians will just say, uh, practitioners will just say that flatline's all they need for the diagnosis. But I wanted more. I just felt like 
I wanted more. So I would always follow up with the urine test. I'm a bit like that. I'm a practitioner that does like to test. I do like concrete evidence wherever I can get it. I understand sometimes you don't get concrete evidence, but as, as a generalization, that's what I like to have because it just makes me feel really absolutely certain I'm doing absolutely the right thing because of what's in front of me. So it just helps me. So Yeah. And in terms of that testing, I don't know when uh, the breath testing, I don't have an estimated time, but obviously it's in the works. You know, Dr. Pimentel's just yeah. just talked about a study. He's doing it. So I don't think it'll be too long before we have it in breath. Am I right in thinking earlier in the year, some other people had ran like possibly some scientists in India, possibly. It's really exactly. A that, while. That's the article that the other, really, that's the two, the ah, second one, right, came out okay. a, a year ago in May 2016. Okay. And they had they had run it on that huge room-sized right. machine. Okay, you and, retained much more information about it than I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I wrote to them and uh, we corresponded uh, because I was I was like, oh, my God, this is really yay. the first sulfide SIBO study, you know, yeah. and I was thrilled. So, um, yeah. And they were basically saying the same thing. It's just these studies are establishing the fact and importance of hydrogen sulfide in SIBO. Yeah. Yeah. Which is. Yeah. So you can, it's kind of. In the UK, I think it's kind of still the new kid on the block, but obviously it's been oh, going everywhere. On for, yeah, but it's starting to pop up everywhere, and I thought it was worth us discussing it because it's going to be more and more relevant, I think, isn't it, as time goes on. So, okay. What about CFO? That's another thing oh, yeah. we hear. It keeps popping up on social media. So I just wanted to just give it a little mention so that people could, if they get test results, they can kind of interpret in between well not in between but they can understand the difference between CFO yeah. and testing for CFO and breath testing well it's small intestine fungal overgrowth the F, the F stands for fungal so it's basically yeast overgrowth you know or candida it has all these names or yeast hypersensitivity but the concept here is uh, with CFO is saying that it's localized to the small intestine. You know, with all the stool tests uh, a lot of us practitioners do, we, we might be able to see if it's in the large intestine, but what if it's not? What if it's in the small intestine? And you mentioned testing. Um, yeast testing has always been, you know, a bear, problematic. You know, we always have to use history. And then for testing, we have stool, but that will only show the large intestine. We mm -hmm. have um, urine organic acid testing. That shows small and large intestine, but doesn't distinguish between the two. Yeah. And then we have the blood test with um, with the antigen, the immune uh, antibody antigen complex and and um, immunoglobulins. And that lets us know basically what that test is for. You could sort of say it's for yeast anywhere in the body. But really what it shows is does does that person's immune system think that it's having a problem with yeast? So that's kind of nice because that can show even if you don't have an overgrowth, uh, then that even if so, then that would just be hypersensitivity. But maybe they do have an overgrowth. Either way, that their body has decided that yeast is an issue. Now, that one other thing about that is. Um, what if they have an overgrowth and their immune system has decided not to respond? So, you know, so yeah. this is, you can see, every test has its problems. You know, the, the urine um, organic acid test and the stool test are only showing one or two locations, and the other one has its issues too. So, you know, yeast testing has always been troublesome, you know? Yeah, yeah, it is. And but, it's kind of like, which one shall I choose for this person? Which one's, the, you know, really the one that's going to be most beneficial to them? But, um, I, I just want to say quite often with my clients, I will do, uh, if I'm sus suspicious of SIBO, I'll do a breath test, which might lead on to urine test. But I often run a stool test at the same time. Yeah. Um, and there are some markers that you can see that are raised if somebody has SIBO, but you don't know if it's raised because somebody's got SIBO or it was part of a thing that kind of led and was kind of driving a bit of it. Um, so, for instance, we have um, we know that SIBO interferes with the way that fats are absorbed. So quite often with a stool test, you'll see super high levels of fecal fat. But that might be a completely unrelated issue that's going on that also needs addressing. So I think, you know, when you're looking at testing, I think it's being very aware that the question to ask people to ask themselves is what are you trying to find out? Mm -hmm. And if they can think about what they're trying to find out, that might help them. Because like you say, with the with the CFO, we can look for the immune function, we can look at assist, uh, the small or large, or we can look at the large intestine. So 
there are a lot of tests around which are super confusing for people but it, it's you know in a lot of places I, I will give people um, support to choose the right test but there are lots and lots of places that will do that as well and I think but again I don't want to go on about it but I do like testing because I like to see what's going on because then I can treat appropriately. Yeah so you don't guess and this brings up a super important point about CIFO and SIBO by the way the um, the rates of having both is about one third it's about a third of SIBO patients you know, who have SIBO will also have the fungal overgrowth. So that's there's about a third overlap. But the, the super important point is that what the studies have shown on CIFO and SIBO is that they have the exact same symptoms. Now, I don't think that everybody, every practitioner thinks in their mind that yeast overgrowth can actually cause the exact same symptoms as SIBO and IBS. There's a few that we might have thought it would have done, but they really found exactly the same symptoms. And so why that's so important is be because your treatment is completely different, yeah. you know, yeah. for you know, one's antifungal, one's antibacterial. Now, granted, if you're using herbs, most herbs have both antifungal and antibacterial. So, okay, maybe not in that situation. But in, if you're just guessing, you know, you don't know what you're treating and what the person has. So that's where testing can be good. And by the way, the testing that they used in the CFO studies was culture. We didn't mention that. Uh, that's okay. just not very available. It's um, culture is done th through endoscopy, so a tube through the mouth, um, okay. down and through the stomach right. into the small intestine. They sample out the fluid there and then grow it. See what grows. Wow. Does bacteria grow? Does yeast yeah. grow? And then which bacteria, which yeast? And so, so that's considered the gold standard. It's a direct test. But it's not very accessible in office practice. No. So that's why I didn't mention that as a standard yeast test. It's yeah. that's kind of a bit more for research purposes. The thing to keep in mind is if you do have a patient going in for endoscopy, for some reason, you can always ask for a SIBO or a CFO, like a culture, basically. You can ask I've for a culture. I've never done that, but I'm going to try and see what kind of response, because that would be amazing if we could get that. Yeah. So I might talk to you about that another time in more detail. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Like good. Okay, so that's great. So we've talked about the breath test, we've talked about the urine test, we've talked about the three different types of SIBO, and we talked a little bit about CFO. Um, I just wanted to kind of mention the common mistakes people make when they are breath testing. Um, I, shall I run through a few? Just Please. Yeah, we were talking about this ahead of time, and you had a bunch that you were, well, you go ahead and say them. <laughs> well, we have... We occasionally get people, you get a test comes back and you go, and you have to go, did that person actually take the lactulose solution, which um, you do a control breath sample, then you drink the lactulose solution or glucose if they're doing a glucose test. And occasionally people have forgotten to do that. Occasionally people have mixed up their tubes so they're in the wrong order. So we get odd kind of spread of pattern. Sometimes there's a little hole in the bag and people tape up the, the hole in the bag. <laughs> um, but doing the breath test, there was, was it January or February, there was a collection. And were you on the panel that sat on the new rules for the kind of... I, I wasn't on the panel, but yeah, there, we have new North American breath test consensus. It just came out in uh, March and I actually wrote a review of it in my newsletter and it's a wonderful article. Which, and, which is great. And one of the new things that seems to have been really clarified there is that people, if people are constipated, they should follow the prep diet for two days, and if they don't, if they're not constipated, they just follow the prep diet for one day. And this is a special diet. Um, it's quite restrictive, and it's quite interesting. I ask people to write down their symptoms whilst doing the prep diet and during the test, um, because that can give a little bit of an insight into what's going on. And it's basically a diet that doesn't contain anything that's fermentable by, by the bacteria. So when people drink the solution, which is fermentable by the bacteria, we don't get the confusion of, was that dinner you had last night? Or is that <laughs> the drink you just drank? Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, if people don't prep diet properly, we, again, we have to have a little conversation and kind of make sure that they have to help us interpret the results. And then the other thing is fasting for 12 hours. Some people don't quite manage to do it properly, which again can kind of give slightly confusing results that might mm -hmm. kind of... So I don't know if you 
have any those are about? those are probably the main ones i think the, the 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 two main that i hear about is yeah people fiddling with the uh, breath test collection mechanism taping things up and thinking things shouldn't be the way they they are yeah. Yeah. and uh, not following the prep diet um there's a little bit uh, of i guess you could say cheating that can be gotten away with like especially if it's the breakfast because the prep diet's done for the the day before the test you have a special diet, you fast overnight, and then the next morning. So if the breakfast before you had, you know, a, a baby carrot or something like that, it might turn out okay. But you'll be able to tell if people um, have really cheated badly uh, the way the results look, at least in the classic pattern, which yeah. is that the uh, control sample before, you know, it's, it's just called the baseline, that will be elevated and it will likely be the highest breath sample of gas in the entire in the hunt well, at least in the first two hours and that lets us know if somebody yeah. did the prep diet yeah. wrong so yeah. you know we can, we can tell yeah we can yeah. we can we can see the cheaters yeah <laughs> I think we'll know. Know. so don't we cheat know. yeah <laughs> and the other thing i always like to tell people is it's just one day you know it's like it's not, one yeah. day of your life like yeah. you know yeah. not going to go on forever and also as you were indicating a lot of people will feel significantly better because they've immediately taken out all the fermentable carbs yeah. which and that is just like to me i was like oh that's a really big box that's been ticked there that really helps because sometimes the results can be slightly inconclusive and you have to do a lot of interpreting in between have a lot of conversations but think Things like that really help to make a decision. And I've actually had a gastroenterologist um, prescribe rifaximine off the back of the um, symptoms somebody had whilst doing the breath test. Tests looked negative, but the way that they responded to it made, uh, made the gastroenterologist treat. So it's so worth keeping a track. And when people um, receive one of our smart SIBO breath tests, they do get a, an A4 document where they can keep track of how they are beforehand and during. Um, and then they obviously get a full set of instructions as well with um, some meal ideas and menu ideas. So it's not like we kind of go off you go on your own. We do try and support people through that. Um, yeah, so I kind of think people do need to pay attention to that to make sure they get the best information they can so that we can do our best to help them, really. That's exactly. It. Yeah. So like you say, it's just one day. Unless you're constipated, then it's two. Well, right, right, <laughs> <laughs> right. I should have said that. <laughs> okay, so now here's a, here's a question that you must have heard a hundred times. Um, it commonly asks this one. How long does it take to get rid of SIBO? Well, there's a spectrum because there's a spectrum of like presentations and severity, I guess we could say. And um, the maybe the easiest way to think about it is this is to think about the statistics of for how many people is this a, an easy problem, so to speak, a, an acute or short term problem. And then for how many people is this a chronic ongoing condition? And the statistics on that is one third it's acute and two thirds it's chronic. So chronic meaning like it's just not going to be cured. You know, it's they have probably an underlying condition that will is not able to be corrected, or at least not with common knowledge now, and it was just going to continue to lead to always create SIBO. So just briefly, some examples of that would be really the most common way people get um, SIBO, which is through food poisoning, also called um, traveler's diarrhea, stomach flu, or technically acute gastroenteritis. Um, about half of those cases will uh, spontaneously get better, and then half won't. So, and the reason why is there's autoimmune nerve damage going on, and no one knows how to actually cure that at this time. So that's an example. Um, there's surgical situations that people have, like short bowel syndrome, um, ileocecal valve removal. That means they're probably going to live with a very high risk of SIBO for a long time. People with systemic sclerosis almost always progress on in that disease to get SIBO, and that disease is incurable and irreversible. So there's conditions that can lead people to always having SIBO. But back to the how long does it take to get rid of it. For the cases that are the one-third of the, the one-third of cases that are a little easier that aren't chronic, I think you're looking at, you know, maybe one to two months. Um, it depends on what type of treatment, but if you, um, and, and the whole order of everything, if you've been tested, that takes a little time, and then you get your treatment. If your treatment was antibiotics, it's usually a two-week course, and if you had a simple case, then you'll be handled in two weeks. Two weeks would be all you would need, and so it could be as short as two weeks or however long it took you to get the test and then the treatment, so maybe you know maybe we're looking at a month. Um, in the, in the two-thirds that are chronic, we're looking at the shortest there's probably more like 
three months, but I would say six months um, is more likely. And very often I see a year. That's to get an initial test negative. Of course, I am seeing a harder, harder population base. Um, so six months to uh, to a year would be average, maybe three months if you're lucky. And that might be more of the the milder yeah. spectrum. Yeah. 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 Then once you get the initial test negative, and the reason it takes so long is because um, when gas is higher, and that's one of the reasons we need the test, you'll need multiple rounds of antimicrobials usually to to treat that because one round just isn't enough. To you know, just you have to keep going till you get that gas down. So it takes time. Um, uh, so anyway, you get the initial test negative, and then the relapse starts. And the, why does why does relapse happen? Because uh, the underlying condition is there that is causing it, which in many cases is mysterious or we are not able to identify or if it takes time to identify. And there's a lot of things that can cause SIBO. I mean, like, for instance, endometriosis, you know, there's anatomical things and that can take investigation, seeing different doctors. Yeah. Anyway, when the relapses begin, I, I say it takes usually another another good year uh, to get those well controlled, maybe six months to get those where you've sort of really made that not happen so often. You've, you've figured out what's right for that person to, to make their remission periods be longer and, and get that in hand. And meanwhile, of course, you're looking at underlying cause or referring out for that. So, you know, SIBO in, so basically the, the summary here is that for a third of people who have SIBO, it isn't complicated and it, and it gets relieved really just by removing the bacteria. The, you know, the, basically the underlying cause has probably already resolved itself in those people. Maybe it was low stomach acid due to stress or um, maybe it was food poisoning, but the person's body is fixing itself, that sort of thing. So maybe the underlying cause has already really resolved itself. So all you really need to do is just get that overgrowth of bacteria out of the small intestine, which, because the body has a hard time doing that on its own. So you just assist, and then bam, they're good. But for two-thirds of cases, there's there are other diseases, other conditions that are going on that are leading to the SIBO that have to be figured out, and that isn't the easiest thing to do. And it can take time to do that. And then meanwhile, you are treating the bacteria. They often have high gas. It takes many rounds. And then you have relapses to contend with. So yeah. that's the... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, didn't, I, yeah I, I guess I'm finding very similar to you that sometimes you do a repeat breath test and kind of symptomatically you're thinking this is looking good. You get the breath test back, you're like, yay, it's that was one of the easy ones. And other times you've done a few month long program with somebody and you're like, I don't want to keep you on this for such a long time without checking what's happening and want to be safe and then you get a breath test back and you're like oh this is unfortunately one of the long hauls and I so feel for those people because they try so hard they're doing all the right things but it is unfortunately really tricky isn't it in some cases to to get rid of it 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 doesn't go that easily for some but I think I mean my next question well actually I would say for the majority two-thirds so the majority of people with SIBO it's not quick or easy it's cha it's challenging so I think it's important for both patients and practitioners particularly practitioners to have the reality in their head so that they don't think it's something that they it's their fault like I'm not good enough at treating yeah. this condition this is a tough condition and um, and one of the reasons it's tough is because it's usually secondary there's something else causing it it's it, you know so you got to deal with that and also so people have more than even just two things wrong with them or one or two things wrong. So hormonal imbalances really affect motility. Um, there's anemia that can develop. That affects the rate of healing. So there's a lot to be looked at. It really requires a lot of medical sort of uh, oversight and expertise and diagnosis and management. And we really have to assist all, all sorts of uh, – find and assist all sorts of issues. Yeah. I think what I often say to my patients, it's like they have their own health picture and it's like a jigsaw puzzle and the number of pieces they've got and the size and relevance of those pieces is different for every individual with SIBO. Absolutely. It's a SIBO piece, but the driver that caused the SIBO piece and the other things affecting it around, plus the other things nothing to do with SIBO, make their individual picture unique. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it changes. It's a little bit like I was... I say it's a bit like being in a museum and they've cleaned up the picture. You take off the top layer and you're like, oh, this is now going on behind. We can see this now. Right, now we need to do this. So, yeah, it can be a long... You know, I think what can really get to people is... 
you know, they've been suffering. And then they then they find out they have SIBO. And I think what happens for a lot of people is they think, now we know what it is. Yay, it's bacterial oriented. I can use an antibiotic, like some sort of infection, like a, you know, upper respiratory infection or whatever, urinary tract, and then it'll just be gone. Yeah. And so then they get their hope stashed. Their expectations aren't aligned properly. Yeah. And, um, and, and who would want anything other than that you you know let's get yeah, rid of it and so, yeah. and for a third of cases it works like that but for the majority it doesn't and so and i think what happens for people is um especially because like ibs is a chronic condition but it um a lot of people don't actually know that you know and so yeah. uh, everyone's looking for the way to make their suffering go away really fast and so the thing is the symptoms can be 100% resolved and you can still have this as a chronic condition that you just need to have some management on like a, a bit of a special diet. It might not even be horrible, but you know, and maybe a prokinetic medicine or whatever. And I think it just takes people coming to terms and maybe even going through a grief process mm -hmm. of realizing that they do have a chronic condition, but it doesn't mean they can't feel lots and lots better. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that kind of answers more what my next question was going to be. Once it's gone, how do you keep it away? And again, it's quite individual, but classic. Well, we, ha we have some classic things we do. So what, what we advise for everybody is um, a prokinetic. So a prokinetic is, um, you know, either a supplement or a prescription medicine that you would take that is Whole, its whole job is meant to stimulate the migrating motor complex in the small intestine. And that's a form of motility in the small intestine. That's whole job is meant to clear bacteria out of the small intestine. And that's probably the number one real physiologic no, underlying reason why, people, yeah, yeah, yeah. why most people have it. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Well, I, I was, I, I wasn't doing that to say something, but um, it, was, it is the number one. And I have so many clients where I'm like, okay, take the prokinetic. Don't stop until I say stop, keep at it. They run out and they think, well, I won't take it because I'm not going to see it That's for a couple right. of weeks. And I, I, I used an analogy the other day with somebody. I was like, right, imagine a police car with its sirens whirring that when you stop taking it, it's coming to get you. The police car with the siren is coming to get you. It's going to arrest you for not taking the prokinetic. And it's like, <laughs> please take the prokinetic. Go to the toy it's, shop. It's the, really the number one key yeah. key treatment. You know, and this is a big thing that is um, missing in a lot of people's understanding of SIBO is that treatment of SIBO is twofold. There's the getting rid of the bacteria yeah. and then there's preventing it from coming back yeah. with the prokinetic yeah. and the prevention. So yeah. Prokinetic is key. So whether it's a natural one or a prescription one, and the prescription ones I do believe work are, are a bit stronger. They work a bit better, which is important to know for people who have only been doing natural ones. If they're relapsing often, they probably need to switch yeah. over to the yeah. stronger ones. But anyway, we do a prokinetic and then we do um, uh, some sort of a you know, low carb, low fiber diet. It doesn't at this period have to be a strict because now the bacteria are gone, but just to help for prevention of them coming back, we do a low fiber, low carb diet, a lot of options there. And then we do meal spacing as best as you can. So if possible, four hours between meals. So four hours where you're not snacking and um, hopefully maybe not even having like a latte filled with lots of milk because that is nutrition. So, um, so it can be hard, but as best as a person can, four hours between meals um, and then a 12 hour fast overnight. So that uh, what that's doing is the migrating motor complex works during fasting periods w when we're not eating. So it gives it a chance to clear the bacteria out. And especially you've got your prokinetic on board there assisting it. So those are the three essential preventions. And then I can say there's some others we can consider. Um, stress reduction is very important. And it, really anybody needs it, <laughs> you know, who's yeah. living at least maybe, you know, not whatever. I'm sure there are some people who've gotten their life settled, but most of us need stress reduction. But we, need yeah, <laughs> we particularly need it for digestive function because most of our digestive functions, including um, hydrochloric acid secretion, enzyme secretion, and migrating motor complex occur in the rest and digest phase. So when we're rushing and worrying and stressed out, we can't do that. So if we're, if we're doing our four hour uh, in between meal fast, but we're totally freaked out, we yeah. might not get as good of a migrating motor complex. So stress tech reduction techniques are important. And then um, we can add hydrochloric acid or enzymes if we think we need that support because those are both antimicrobial. So it's just a little bit of constant antimicrobial. And lastly, I would suggest um, some kind of body work. And there's so many types of body work from acupuncture, massage, 
chiropractic, uh, cranial sacral, uh, osteopathic. My favorite for SIBO is visceral manipulation um, because it really gets in there and works on the internal abdominal organs. And so often SIBO is a, a structural and, you know, a physical sort of problem. It's about a certain location. And we're usually either having problems with the motility of, of that small intestine or there's um, anatomical structural impingements. And so uh, I find visceral manipulation seems to help with both motility and structural. And so I, that's what I like to recommend. Uh, for everybody except, I think, two patients that I've sent it for have have had a noticeable benefit. Okay. And so um, I think that's a very good thing to add. Now, you don't have to do visceral. You could do, uh, you could do acupuncture. You could do massage. You know, choose the form of body work. But get someone's hands in a therapeutic way on your body to make some movement and, and assist the structure. So those are the, so those are six things. I'll just say them again really quickly. There's prokinetic diet, meal spacing. We've got body work, stress reduction, and then um, hydrochloric acid and enzymes. Those are the things that we can think about doing. Fantastic. Yeah. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, have we got time just for a couple of quick little questions? Oh, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, a question I see on social media often is why do some people gain weight and some people lose weight? What's your yeah, take on that? so I'll just give you my my clinical take, particularly on the weight gain picture. The weight loss is very common in SIBO, and there's a lot of I'd say that's more common. There are some people that their weight um, isn't affected at all, but it's very common to see people lose weight without really wanting to lose weight. I mean, without intending to lose weight. Now, sometimes it's welcome. Sometimes people are like, okay, I didn't mind. But uh, very often what we get into is people go underweight, and it's, it, it's not desirable. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for that. It, one reason is the we use low-carbohydrate diets for, uh, to help manage SIBO symptoms, and low-carbohydrate diets are weight loss diets. Also, patients will restrict the amount of food that they're eating because when they eat is when symptoms come. So they'll either skip meals, they'll, they'll do a lot of fasting, or they'll have very small portion sizes, and then they begin to lose weight from that. Um, and then, but then there's other things. First of all, the bacteria itself is competing for the food uh, in the small intestine. And so there is a malabsorption situation going on in SIBO. And so it can steal the, the person's food. So they can lose weight from that. And then they, um, the symptoms that it creates can make a person not be able to eat, like nausea. Uh, there can be severe nausea in SIBO, and a person just cannot, you just can't eat when you're seriously nauseous. Or uh, a feeling of food sitting in your stomach like a brick, and it won't go down, and the meal is right there that you ate for the day. You, you're just not going to take another meal. So even if the person would have wanted to, the symptoms are preventing them from eating. And then um, lastly, there are some symptoms like uh, profuse uh, diarrhea that just causes weight loss. Um, so I just wanted to mention those things. Now, about the uh, – and by the way, the best thing we can do for that is get in there and treat that SIBO, get the bacteria gone, and then all of those situations can res can resolve, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, weight gain, um, uh, as, as you mentioned in, in earlier when we were talking, there's some association in the research between methagenic uh, microbes and, and methane gas and weight gain. So that could be a reason. But I will tell you that – more often, what I see clinically is it's, it seems to be a bit unrelated. Uh, and what I mean, the, the weight gain, what I mean is it seems to be hormonal. Um, because even when we clear the methogenic bacteria, the weight gain persists for some people. Now, not for some. There are some people where it really did seem to come on just from the SIBO. We clear the SIBO, and then they are able to lose weight. So that's likely associated with methane bacteria. Or what if they didn't have methane bacteria? Some process that was going on there that was from the SIBO that's once the SIBO is removed. But I really do see a lot of people where they have weight gain, and it's not really exactly from the SIBO. And... Um, you know, it might have seemed like it was because it came, you know, started to come in around and it's really hormonal imbalance. And so and then when we get them over to seeing because I'm not a, a hormone specialist, but I refer for that. And when they see specialists for that, they get their hormones balanced. The weight starts to come off. So I wanted to mention that clinically because I think um, sometimes we try and pin too much on the SIBO, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's very easy to go. That's all it is. That's all it is. And we yeah. have to look much further, don't we, afield to see, sometimes. see everything. I mean, sometimes. Yeah. 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 So now what about yourself? Do you have anything to add on that of what you see? Um, 
I, I think you've answered that perfectly, really, really well. Um, I do remember, in relation to the methanogens, I remember listening to a podcast mm -hmm. with um, Mark Pimenthal last year, and he did a section about it, about methane. And sadly, right now, I can't remember what he said, but I know there was a link, possibly that the increase of bacteria increased the short-chain fatty acids, and the short-chain fatty acids were used as are used as an alternative energy source. And if you've got more short-chain fatty acid produced by more bacteria, it meant that it could cause weight gain. That was one link, I remember. And there was another one, which I'm going to find out, and I'm going to put in a blog on my <laughs> Smart Sivo test site. I'm going to re-listen to it um, and let people yeah. know, because right now I can't remember. Um, but yeah, yeah I've, I've, read, I've read all those studies and I don't remember what the mechanisms are. I mean, I read them all like it, this all came out like three years ago and I yeah, can't remember. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to revisit them again. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think what really matters is just to know there there has been shown to be an association of weight gain and methane. So if a person has weight gain and methane, maybe that's it. Clearing the SIBO, the methane should take care of it. And if it doesn't, well, then you've got to look for something else. And in a lot of cases, I do see that to be hormonal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And yeah. just one more, if that's all right. Oh, yeah, no, it's fine, go right ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've heard you speak on other podcasts and in lectures I've attended and the SIBO Symposium, which you obviously organized, uh, which is fantastic, by the way. Not this year, I'm not even involved this year. So <laughs> <Is that like laughs> I'm taking a break because I have enough jobs right now. <laughs> yeah, I think you do, <laughs> I think you do. But in the past, you've organized them and they've yes. been fantastic. They're, um, just so people know, that's where a lot of all the world leaders, um, thought thinkers in SIBO come together and lecture for a couple of days. And then um, they do like a pod, they're not podcasts, they're just lectures, that symposiums that we can... Webinars, yeah. Webinars, Webinars. thank you. And uh, it's just such, it's just fantastic because personally, I shouldn't talk about myself, but I go for a walk along the beach every day. I take an hour's lecture with me and every day I listen to one. And most of them come from your symposiums. Um, there's a couple of others as well that you've also lectured on which are yeah. just fantastic so um the other yeah so i've heard you talk about this question before on podcasts and webinars um it's just probiotics now i understand what you used to think but the world because the world of SIBO evolves and changes so quickly i'm just wondering what your current thinking is about the use of probiotics alongside SIBO um, after a SIBO treatment, um, beforehand, everything, although obviously okay. I, I don't want to keep um, you here that much longer. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, yeah, uh, I don't think my thinking has drastically changed. I'm, I'm always looking at this question. It's such an important question. And just briefly, um, I, one of the things I put my attention to recently is to help organize a, a SIBO summit. And um, like one of those free online health summits, and it, uh, I wasn't the lead on it, but I've been helping quite a bit. And that'll that'll be happening June 24th, and and the week after that. Um, but I was very interested to hear what all of the uh, speakers had to say about probiotics, and there really are some very different approaches. And when I hear a lot of uh, you know experienced people with different approaches, that always makes me open my mind and I relook at what I think. So I'm kind of like always rethinking about it. But here's here's what I think. I think that I like to take each case individually. I don't think I'm not a person who says any one thing about uh, probiotics and SIBO. I don't think everyone should take them with SIBO. I don't think everyone shouldn't take them with SIBO. I don't think everyone should take them, you know, as an enema and shouldn't because some people think that. I don't, I don't think that. I don't think any one thing. I customize it to each individual. So that's, that's the main thing I can say about probiotics. Uh, there are a lot of people who are very aggravated by probiotics who have SIBO. Sometimes this is due to other conditions like histamine intolerance and things like that. Uh, sometimes it's because there were prebiotics in it, in, in the uh, uh, pro probiotic. Sometimes it's not. Uh, probiotics can, they make acids that then other bacteria, the overgrown SIBO bacteria, can then turn into gas. So through a process of cross-feeding, uh, probiotics can worsen gas, and that can worsen all the symptoms. I particularly, when people are aggravated, what I'll particularly see is, the, is their bloating gets worse. Sometimes at the same time, when their bloating gets worse, their bowel movements get better. So the probiotic might correct constipation or diarrhea at the same time that it worsens bloating and then we have to pick well what do we care more about you know it's very frustrating we yeah. see that same thing with fiber if we do try some fiber um so 
what I do is I, I try and figure out, have probiotics bothered you in the past? And take a look at which probiotics they've, they've tried. Um, um, and then I go forward from there. If they've really bothered a person every single time, no matter what, they've tried them 25 times, I don't go there. Uh, it's like we don't need to do that. And if they've been really helped, we use them. Um, if they're not so sure, we try. We try them. Where I'm most hesitant in trying probiotics is once they're better. And the reason why is because when I get someone better, so now they're, and what I consider that is 90% symptom relief and, and or a negative test. Um, there's some things we could talk about with that. But anyway, um, really, I'm caring here about the symptoms. So let's say they're really feeling better and they have a negative test. Often, when I now have added something to the mix, and, and I mean, I've already done all the stuff I do for um, prevention, so prokinetics and stuff like that. But now, if I'm thinking of adding something in the mix, usually I trigger them and aggravate them and throw them off the good path that they're on. I don't like to rock the boat. I just had too many negative experiences. So I don't want to use theory oh, we've done antimicrobials, now we should go in with probiotics. I don't want to use that theory. If they're really doing great, why should I do anything? They're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. I, I've just had a lot of trouble with that. So the way I, I would recommend avoiding that is test probiotics beforehand. Now, uh, maybe they'll react to them because they have the SIBO, but still, uh, give it a go when they're when they have the SIBO when you're doing treatment because if you're doing antimicrobial treatment it doesn't really matter if you're you know if you have any kind of concern that you're giving more bacteria as a probiotic so give it a go and see what happens just so you have a, a marker and then you can decide whether you want to do it after or not now this is just my experience and there are a lot of other people that feel quite differently um, you, if you listen to the summit you'll hear that a lot of the people really believe in doing probiotics after I just have a tricky patient population that I see yeah. and I've, yeah. I've learned to be cautious. cautious. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but I, one last thing I want to say is that there are people where we kind of have to use them. Like they have um, a history of yeast and, you know, we're giving them antibiotics or something like that, or they, or we're concerned about C. diff and we want to present C, prevent C. diff. So, so I'm not going to say I'm never going to use them. I'm, I'm going to just be a clinician with all my tools available to me and I'm going to assess each situation and decide what's right. Fab. That, that is such a good, clear answer. Sorry, we got a bit of feedback again. But it's... <laughs> But there are so many people that are super confused over whether they should or they shouldn't. And I think like you, I tend to do it on an individual case, but I very much err on the side of caution with the, with the use of them. And I get some people that beg me to use them. I'm like, okay, let's give it a go. Let's see how you are. But we need a kind of level playing field in order to be able to assess whether or not it's helping or hindering. So I think it's it's really helpful that you're being really clear about that so people recognise that there isn't a black and white answer, although people will be frustrated with the greyness, unfortunately, yeah. that, that's the reality of what we're dealing with. We, we can't be absolutely sure um, at this time, and we hope in time research go what goes on. I've read a meta-analysis recently about the use of yes. probiotics with SIBO, and it, it said it cannot cure, which we always knew, but it seemed generally to say that it was help, it would help with symptoms. But I think like you, I find it helps some people and it doesn't help others. So it is a really individual, unique to, you know, one person. And I think what gets really um, frustrating is that there are, there's a small group of people that, that will give probiotics to, and it is their miracle. And it's almost like their, their miracle cure. And it's like that was what they needed. And everything gets better. And when you see that with anything that you give, you want to try that thing with everybody. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's yeah. like you want yeah. that response. So I think most of us practitioners have seen enough of miracles from probiotics yeah. that we want to try them with people. Yeah. But yeah. it's just people react differently. Yeah. So you yeah. can. You can try it. And if it doesn't yeah. work, just yeah. don't do it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I certainly, if I do try it with people, I go in with very small amounts, very gently and gradually. I don't go in with the, the great big, you know, hundreds of billions and billions. It's like, yikes. No, let's just start with a pinch and see how you get on. Um, mm -hmm. And just kind of very gently myself. That's what I do. So. Oh, and one other thing. When I said I don't do them after, um, that's only for a period. I want to I don't want to rock the boat for a period of time. So maybe three to six months. Uh, I want to observe and see what stabilizes and shakes out and 
then after that, you know, because most of us know that fermented foods, probiotics coming in our diet as food or as supplements are an important and healthy way to live. So I'm, I'm very interested in people doing that. Um, I, I'm more interested in them bringing in fermented food first, even before supplements, because that's a, so natural and a part of normal human behavior. Um, but so I, I just wanted to make that clear that it's not I may not do that forever. I just, there's yeah. a period at which I want to be careful and observe. Yeah. Straight after treatment, it's like, ooh, just be careful. Yeah, just, yeah. ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just see if this holds. <laughs> yeah, let's see what's happening in a few weeks and a month or so, yeah. Okay, that's fantastic, Alison. Thank you so much that you've shared so much information so freely. I really appreciate it. As I'm you sure are everybody, so welcome. Well, everybody that's listening, I'm sure really appreciates all you do as well for the world of SIBO. And uh, I think your new, uh, your new, I've heard it said, you're now the SIBO queen is absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm always like, where's my crown? <laughs> yeah, perhaps we should send you one because you've really yeah. earned that. You've earned that title, absolutely. So thank you so much. Really good luck with your book. And I'll really look forward to when, did you say the date of this new training you've got coming out? No, I'm not sure when. Okay. I hope for the fall of 2017 is what that I'm hoping. Okay, but we've got in a month, what's coming out in a month? Just remind me. SIBO you. Summit. Uh, it's called SIBO SOS Summit. That's June 24th. Hopefully right. I'll have my online course available for everybody in the fall and then hopefully the book in, in early 2018. Right, great. Well, I'll put a link on the video um, so that people can um, find that as well for you. So again, thank you so much. And um, hopefully I will see you again soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.